You are coming off what you're calling your best quarter in your 36 year history. Now, records are very hard to keep beating. What do you tell your investors about where you go from here and how you squeeze out that next leg of growth? Well, Shanali, it's great to be with you. I'll just stop for a moment and talk about the quarter because it's nice to focus on it. We really delivered for our customers. We had nearly record appreciation in our funds. Uh, we had extraordinary fundraising and for our shareholders, record fee related and distributable earnings. And what's driving that I'd say is a couple things. First off is where we focused in terms of investing really thematically. Uh, some areas like global logistics, software and technology, the travel recovery out of COVID, all of those have done quite well. You saw that in the quarter. And the second thing I'd note is we continue to expand what our business is about, who we invest for, where we invest. We're moving more and more in core plus real estate and in infrastructure, direct lending. Um, and we're also uh, serving more clients. We're serving more institutions, retail, insurance, and we've described it as a ship that's been operating in a narrow channel moving to open water. So it was a great quarter for us and we're excited about what we can do more for our clients. Now, John, a lot of this has also come from fund realization, or, you know, investment realization. You've said you've been selling assets as well as uh, investing in them. Now, is it getting harder to invest at these valuations and with all of the choppiness we're starting to see in the markets? Well, it's certainly trickier as values move up to deploy capital. Uh, the good news is we have some competitive advantages. One is we operate in almost all our businesses at very large scale. So this year, we've done something like 13 public to privates that we've been invested in. Uh, that's a real competitive advantage given size. The breadth of our platform continues to expand, as I noted before. That helps us a lot. So many of our large investments were in our newer areas. And then again, what we're trying to do is find interesting areas in some of these thematic neighborhoods that we love where we can buy in at a more favorable price. So we bought in India an automotive parts company several years ago that had at that time a very small EV business, but we saw a huge potential. We invested in that considerably. The company's called Sona Comstar. That company has gone public, hugely successful investment. We've made something like 15 times our investors' capital because we found a really great company that people didn't realize was an on-theme investment. And we're doing that this quarter again in the um, uh, garage door opener business with a company called Chamberlain, which owns the LiftMaster brand. It's a play on the housing recovery that's happening as well as e-commerce and access to homes which makes so much sense through the garage. So I would say our response to a high price market is try to buy things we like, but do it in a little bit of one derivative off or where we find value in those areas. And that's the real challenge. Do you agree with some of the competitors that you have in the banking industry? Some of, uh, you know, the, James Gorman over at Morgan Stanley, John Waldron over at Goldman Sachs. Do you believe that they have it right when it comes to inflation, that perhaps there are many who are undercounting how much of an issue it's becoming? Yes, I would agree that inflation is definitely becoming more pervasive, more persistent than people had hoped. Uh, and I think that's happening for a couple reasons. One is money supply has grown really significantly by more than a third since COVID, which happened monetary fiscal response to the crisis, but it puts more money in the system. And then at the same time, we have some big structural shortages. So in housing, we've right. been building, for, yeah, we've been building 40% fewer homes than we did in the past. We've been investing a lot less in energy, yeah. of course, um, for that, you know, because we're trying to balance that out in terms of green sustainability and so forth. And we've seen fewer people in the workforce. Right. So go ahead. Sorry, so, Tom. Jonathan, I, I want to get away from the CEO speak and talk about the structural solution here and weakness. You came out of the University of Pennsylvania, the year of Bill Clinton. You're a card carrying bona fide Democrat. You've been hugely charitable. You're an icon across the nation for charity. Help the Democratic Party now with some charity. How do you guys put the progressives and the moderates together? What's the gray formula? 
Wow, um, that is a big assignment. Well, we're going to do it in 30 they're... seconds, so go. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> go. So I think it's where there are shared objectives. You know, I think there are things where you could say, how can we help people in lower and middle income areas and do things that drive the economy and drive opportunity for them? So immigration would be one where I think we can help the economy. We can help a lot of people. Ideally, we can bring people out of the shadows. Housing would be another area where if we built more housing, that could drive you know, down the cost of rental housing and, and buying homes for lots of people. I think in a green energy context, building housing would help a lot. Education, more investment, doing more in vocational schools, community schools, uh, in order to help people. What I want to do is create more opportunity. I think the debate in the Democratic Party is about whether we should fundamentally change the system we have or should we give more opportunity to people who have less opportunities themselves today? And I vote with that second camp, which is I think we have a powerful system that creates incredible companies, but more people need access to it. My wife and I created a program, New York City Kids Rise, in order to give low-income children in John, New York City the John, opportunity to save. You underplay yeah. yourself. You're buying a building in northern Manhattan in hard cash to build the Gray Elementary School, right? We, we help support Harlem Village Academies. It's certainly something that's important to us. We named it after my grandfather, Leon Gray, who believed a lot in education, the opportunity it created. And we do want to help as many people as possible. And I think that debate that you touch on, Tom, is so important because there is a solution where we can bring more people into the system, give them more opportunity, and still keep the, you know, the energy and power of our economic system to create lots so, of jobs and wealth. John, that's where I wanted to go, this idea of pairing some of the social objectives with the financial objectives of the Democratic Party. We've heard from them this desire to change the composition of the Fed in large part because of the oversight of Wall Street. And I do wonder, from your vantage point, of a $731 billion firm that's expanding into an industry that typically has been private and not regulated as tightly, what do you expect and hope to see on that front? Well, as, as it relates to our firm, I would say we, we are regulated, certainly, uh, in lots of different ways. And we take that, the responsibility, the transparency, how we operate is really, really important. I think the difference between us and large financial firms, banks, is uh, they're highly levered, right? They operate at 10 to 15 times leverage. Uh, they also have access to the Fed window and their depositors are guaranteed. None of that exists in our private, you know, in our business managing capital for third parties. So we are regulated, but it is a different type of regulation. Our activities are different. And I would just say generally today, mm -hmm. I think the financial system in the U.S. is as healthy as I've seen. Uh, the banks have a lot of capital. There is really John. good oversight in markets. We're not seeing big excesses mm -hmm. out there. John, uh, real quick here. I know this big year for succession on Wall Street. A lot of your peers have turned over the ranks at the top. Do you have a timeline over at Blackstone for taking the lead? No. We, we feel pretty good about no, what's happening rude. with Blackstone. <laughs> that was so rude. I didn't He'll mean, give it to I us next to time. Mean. No, 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 no. I, I would say this. Look, we, we, uh, we have a really good setup here. Uh, Steve Schwarzman is an amazing leader, visionary business person. And I can tell you, somebody who's worked with him now for 30 years, uh, it's an incredible yeah. gift for me and the others. So we're sticking with our approach.